Good morning, everyone. I'm Andy Sakin, Director of the Indiana ADRC, and I'd like to welcome you to the 16th Annual Martin Family Alzheimer's Disease Caregiver Symposium. I'd like to begin by acknowledging our three co-founders who initiated the Indiana Alzheimer's Disease Research Center 32 years ago, and we're still going strong. Uh, Dr. Bernardino Getty in uh, the Department of Pathology uh, is still leading our neuropathology core. Professor Hugh Henry, uh, Emeritus uh, Professor of Psychiatry, uh, is still a key advisor. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, uh, Dr. Keneally, um, an outstanding geneticist, uh, has passed, but we remember his input as well. So we thank all of our founders. And now fast forward to 2022, finally, uh, we've been able to get together in person for a research uh, retreat. And here you see most, but not all of the uh, current uh, members of the Indiana ADRC representing many disciplines, many generations of researchers, many, many uh, different areas of expertise and contributions to the center. Shown in the lower right, is uh, some, but not certainly not all, the members of our community advisory board with whom we are so grateful for their input in how to best engage with uh, our community. Uh, this slide is very busy, but reflects the extraordinary funding uh, that has uh, come to Indiana University, the ADRC, and uh, the broad network beyond the ADRC representing Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative disorders. Everything from basic cellular molecular science to clinical trials to drug development um, and much, much more. Um, Indiana's leading many of these studies and a key participant in many others that really span uh, the entire country with many international connections and collaborators as well. So, we're very excited about this large portfolio of research, which is now the uh, fourth highest in the country in support from uh, the uh, National Institute on Aging. Today uh, is really in some ways a tale of, uh, of three women uh, who are just uh, extraordinary. Uh, in, for for uh, this year's Martin Family Alzheimer's Disease Caregiver Symposium, uh, first we remember uh, Mary Ostrom, uh, who was the founding uh, education core leader of the uh, what was then called the Indiana ADC or Alzheimer's Disease Center. Uh, Dr. Ostrom was a key uh, colleague in the development of the center and also in the development of and promotion of career advancement for women and also for uh, uh, broadly for diversity and inclusiveness uh, here at the School of Medicine, uh, where she uh, served as associate dean uh, for diversity uh, later in her career. Uh, we also are so grateful to the Martin family and the many other donors who have contributed to the development of the Indiana ADRC. So uh, today we've heard an announcement from uh, Dr. Bruce Lamb, Executive Director of the Stark Neurosciences Research Institute um, that uh, uh, honors a well-earned uh, distinction uh, for uh, Dr. Sophia Wang, Assistant Professor of Psychiatry, who's also our uh, IADRC Outreach Education and Engagement Core Leader, or ORIC Core as we call it. Uh, Dr. Wang has been named the Wesley P. Martin Scholar of Alzheimer's Disease Education. And today, uh, we have the great honor of having uh, Lisa Barnes uh, from Rush University as our speaker for the Mary Ostrom Memorial Lecture uh, in 2022. Uh, now, Dr. Wang will introduce uh, Dr. Barnes momentarily, but uh, I would like to note that I have the great uh, honor of working uh, closely with Dr. Barnes as co-chair of the Cognitive Working Group of the uh, Alzheimer's Disease Network's Clinical Task Force. And that's just been an extraordinary pleasure to uh, work with Dr. Barnes. And I'm certain that you are gonna greatly enjoy uh, the lecture uh, that she'll be uh, delivering momentarily. So thank you very much. And uh, we'll turn things over to Dr. Wong now.
For more than three decades, the late Dr. Mary Ostrom was a major force in the Indiana Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. As the Wesley P. Martin Professor in Alzheimer's Education, Mary oversaw the Center's Outreach and Recruitment Corps and focused on easing caregiver stress and bringing underrepresented communities to participate in Alzheimer's disease research. In ce celebration of Mary's legacy in the Alzheimer's disease research community, I'd like to officially announce today the next Wesley P. Martin Scholar in Alzheimer's Education, Dr. Sophia Wong. Sophia leads the Outreach and Recruitment Corps once led by Mary and has done a tremendous job to grow its mission. The top priority of the Corps is to engage diverse and underrepresented groups in Indianapolis. They collaborate with their community advisory board to raise awareness of health disparities in the city, all while reflecting the importance of racial and ethnic diversity among the center Alzheimer's disease research patients. Would you please join me in congratulating Sophia? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Sophia Wong. I'm an assistant professor of clinical psychiatry and am the outreach recruitment and engagement core leader for the Indiana Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, which is funded through the National Institute on Aging P30 grant. I'd like to welcome all of you to the 16th annual Martin Family Caregiver Symposium. And I'd like to take a moment to remember Dr. Mary Ostrom. Uh, this keynote lecture recognizes speakers who have made significant contribution to the field of Alzheimer's. And we have a special emphasis on those who have had a uh, focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion in our field. Before we get started, I'd like to recognize two of our sponsors, Sokoa and Alzheimer's Association for the Great Air Indiana Chapter. We'll just take a moment to listen to their messages before we get started. Good morning. I'm Tarek Brown, President and CEO of Sokoa Aging and In-Home Solutions. As a sponsor of the Martin Caregiver Symposium, I am delighted to welcome you. I have been asked to briefly describe Sokoa's mission to the underserved, our work around diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how Sokoa is addressing the needs of family caregivers, especially for those who care for loved ones with dementia or who are minorities. For those of you unfamiliar with our agency, Sokoa is a nonprofit serving central Indiana. Sokoa is not a government agency, but we are a designated area agency on aging, and we like to say our services start where traditional health care ends. Since 1974, we've empowered older adults and people of any age with a disability to live comfortably and safely at home and out of institutional care. Although aging is in our name, Sokoa also serves people of all ages, including over 400 children with medical disabilities that will impact their ability to live independently across their lifetime. Sokoa is not a healthcare provider, but we do offer a wide range of supportive services that have a direct impact on public health. These include our Aging and Disability Resource Center, which is the front door to our services and provides information and referral to community resources. We offer care management for in-home care, senior meals, transportation, home accessibility modifications, and support for the family caregiver. We respect and embrace all differences that make individuals unique. But in recognizing this diversity, we also realize that systemic inequities and disparities that have created gaps in health and aging outcomes across marginalized groups. Equity in health goes beyond access to medical care. Equity in health starts with a conversation about determinants of social determinants of health, meaning how the environments in which people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age affect quality of life outcomes. It looks at the social and environmental obstacles that may prevent someone from living their next life. 
I would also be remiss if I did not mention that equity in health also has a lot to do with trust and rapport, which is to say that in our minority communities, if trust in our healthcare ecosystem in these community-based organizations providing vital services to older adults, if that trust and rapport is not there, we have to start that conversation with rebuilding that trust that may have been damaged over time. Disparities exist around access to resources, disease management, nutrition, mental health care, long-term care, and even end-of-life care. These lifelong inequities contribute to greater inequities in old age. Responding to the needs of a growing diverse population of older adults in a culturally competent manner is a priority for SOCOA and begins with person-centered and family-centered planning. Although we can never become experts in every culture we serve, recognizing there are differences between cultures can help us lean into the differences to build a more solid, trusting relationship. Today, we're taking a fresh look at culturally appropriate strategies for outreach and innovation. Our new initiative involves utilizing community health workers to identify our highest risk population, people that have specific medical conditions that may lead to more ER visits or hospital stays. Then we take preventative measures to ensure clients have what they need to be successful when they return home. We also are taking a fresh look at the needs of caregivers. The unpaid family caregiver faces many challenges from dealing with a loved one's physical and emotional needs to navigating resources, balancing caregiving with other responsibilities, and even managing one's own health. SOCOA comes alongside family caregivers with one-on-one -on -one counseling as well as group education and support. SOCOA offers 15-minute online self-assessment called T-Care that can identify impending caregiver burnout and find solutions to avert a crisis. Currently, 84% of caregivers nationwide report lower levels of stress and depression in as few as six months after a T-Care intervention. We also are the state administrators for the Dementia Friends Indiana Outreach, which seeks to build awareness of and break down stigmas surrounding various forms of dementia. The goal of this initiative is to make life easier for those with dementia and their loved ones and help our community be more understanding and inclusive of this feared condition. We now are providing this training to first year students at Indiana University School of Medicine in Indianapolis and Fort Wayne. The goal here is to help new doctors understand that dementia is really a two person condition affecting both the patients and the family caregiver and that caregivers are likely to suffer their own health crises due to self neglect and caregiver burden. We hope this training will lay a foundation for how practitioners approach dementia and those affected by it and help instill in future doctors a person-centered mindset rather than a disease-centered mindset. SOCOA's vision statement for Indiana is to be a community where older adults and those of any age with a disability flourish. While much has been done, we realize that our work really is just beginning so that this vision truly includes all people. Thank you for your participation in this symposium, and I look forward to working with you to make a difference for older adults, people with disabilities, and their family caregivers. Hello, and welcome to the Martin Family Alzheimer's Caregiver Symposium. My name is Natalie Sutton, Executive Director for the Alzheimer's Association Greater Indiana Chapter. At the Alzheimer's Association, our vision is a world without Alzheimer's and all other dementia. We know that vision will be achieved through scientific progress, and as a result, we're so proud to partner with the Indiana Alzheimer's Disease Research Center on a variety 
of activities throughout the year, including today's event. At the same time that we're advancing scientific progress, we know that people on this journey need help now. And that's why we offer a variety of free, accessible, best-in-class resources to support those living with Alzheimer's and caregivers on their journeys. These resources start with our 24-7 helpline, where master's level social workers and dementia experts are available around the clock, 365 days a year, to answer questions big and small. In addition to the helpline, we have education programs offered in the community and virtually, and we offer more than 45 caregiver support groups in the greater Indiana chapter. We know that engaging diverse perspectives is critical to achieving health equity, meaning that all communities have a fair and just opportunity for early diagnosis, access to risk reduction, and quality care. Underrepresented and underserved communities are disproportionately impacted by Alzheimer's and dementia, yet are less likely to be diagnosed less likely to be recruited to participate in research, and less likely to have access to care and support services. This is unacceptable and must change. And at the Alzheimer's Association, we are leading the way by developing partnerships with trusted national and local organizations to create a pathway to greater health equity, mission engagement, and inclusion for everyone. If you are a caregiver or you know a caregiver who could benefit from the Alzheimer's Association's support, please share our 24-7 helpline, 800-272-3900, or our website, alz.org. And if this mission is important to you, there are so many ways to get involved. Our work is powered by volunteers and our vision of a world without Alzheimer's disease and all other dementia will be achieved by working together. Please connect with us if you are interested in learning more about how you can be part of this work. Thank you again to the Indiana Alzheimer's Disease Research Center for hosting today's event. Before we get started, I just like to take a moment to note that you can claim CME credit for this talk. Please text 75033 to the number 317-671-8998. Once again, please text 75033 to the number 317-671-8998, either 60 minutes before or during and 120 minutes after the end of the activity. I'd like to now introduce our Mary Ostrom commemorative keynote lecturer. Um, this is Dr. Lisa Barnes. She will be speaking about risk factors for cognitive decline and impairment in older African-Americans. Dr. Barnes is the Ella V. and Solomon Jesmer P Professor of Gerontology and Geriatric Medicine. She is the Associate Director of the Rush Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, which is funded through a NIA P30 mechanism and also works as a neuropsychologist there. Her work focuses on the epidemiology of aging and racial differences in chronic diseases of aging. She completed her PhD in biopsychology from the University of Michigan and completed a three-year NIH postdoctoral fellowship in cognitive neuroscience at UC Davis. She is the principal investigator of three community-based cohort studies of older African-Americans and is also the director of the Rush Center of Excellence on Disparities in HIV and Aging. Dr. Barnes is internationally recognized for her contributions to minority aging and minority health, and she has published extensively 
on cognitive aging in older African Americans and has received numerous awards and honors for her work in minority communities. And she gave a really outstanding talk at the NAC fall meeting. And I will be sending out the YouTube link to, to that. So if you want to learn more about Dr. Barnes and her wonderful work, you can have a chance to hear it. Thank you so much. And let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Lisa Barnes. Good morning. My name is Lisa Barnes, and I am a professor and cognitive neuropsychologist, also the associate director of the Rush Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, a um, Alzheimer's disease center located in Chicago. It is a pleasure to be here and participate in the Martin Family uh, Caregiver Symposium, and I thank the organizers for inviting me to um, present some of our research on risk factors for cognitive decline and impairment in older African-Americans. First, however, I would like to uh, set the stage for what we're going to be talking about. Um, Alzheimer's dementia is one of the most feared diseases of old age and has become a public health crisis. Among the leading causes of death, is the only one that cannot be prevented, slowed, or cured. Uh, this slide shows you data from the CDC showing new estimates of Americans with Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. Um, and it shows you that um, there are about 5.8 million Americans living with Alzheimer's. Um, if you look at the panel on the right, it shows you the percentage of adults age 65 and older with Alzheimer's disease by race and ethnicity. And you can see that there is a marked disparity. African Americans uh, represent about 14% uh, of the population with Alzheimer's, Hispanics about 12%, and uh, non-Hispanic whites about 10%. If we look at the projections of, um, of cases, we can see that in 2014, about 5 million people had Alzheimer's disease. But um, by 2060, this number is going to almost triple uh, to 14 million, unless we uh, find a way to prevent the disease or find an effective cure or even an effective treatment. So my research is focused on understanding the epidemiology of Alzheimer's dementia and identifying risk factors. So in thinking about the epidemiology, it's important to understand how this disease impacts people living in society. And one aspect to take note of is the changing demographics of the United States, which is becoming increasingly diverse. So this slide shows you data from um, the US Census, and you can see that um, in 2016, people of color made up about 39% of the population. But in 2050, that number is going to increase and um, they will make much make up more than half of the population um, and actually will represent the largest segment of the adult US population by 2050. And if we look at persons over the age of 65, you know, those who are most at risk for Alzheimer's we see that all of the populations of color are increasing at a faster rate compared to older whites. Older African-Americans in particular, the group that I study, are expected to increase by 131% in less than 10 years. But unfortunately, the scientific field has really struggled to include African-Americans in aging research. And this is a particular problem because there's some data to suggest that um, African Americans are about two times more likely than whites to have Alzheimer's dementia. They are also less likely to receive a diagnosis, a formal diagnosis from a um, memory clinic. Um, and when they do receive a diagnosis, it's often much later in the disease stage. They're also underincluded in um, Alzheimer's disease related and related dementia clinical trials. 
you know, which is the key way that we discover and test out new treatments. Um, so you have this population that's disproportionately burdened. Um, and while they make up 12% of the US population, they're making up less than 5% of those included in clinical trials. So these data show the disparity that I'm, I'm talking about. And these data come from Kaiser Permanente in Northern California, a large uh, healthcare organization. So the investigators um, of this study uh, looked at age-adjusted dementia incidence rates by race and ethnicity in over 270,000 Kaiser enrollees. And they found that dementia incidence rates were highest in African Americans, consistent with prior research, followed closely by American Indian and Alaska Natives, but the rates were intermediate in Latinos, Pacific Islanders, and white Americans. And interestingly, they were lowest in Asian Americans. But we have a potential challenge in interpreting these kinds of results because we know from many studies over many decades that um, older African Americans tend to score lower on cognitive function tests on average than older non-Latino whites. And these are the same tests that are used to make the diagnosis of Alzheimer's. But we know that cognitive function is influenced by many different factors outside of cognition itself. And I've listed some of them on this uh, this diagram here. So things like early life factors, you know, quality of education, but also years of education, health and health behaviors, socioeconomic status, test bias, language, all of these things can affect cognition. And so you're not just measuring ability when you're giving these tests, you have all of these factors that are also influencing performance. And these factors happen to vary by race and ethnicity. So, you know, when we're trying to understand racial differences or understand how um, how people might uh, perform or, or be diagnosed in, in different studies, uh, we really have to be able to understand that when you're looking just at a snapshot picture of performance, where you only have just a cross-sectional view, you really have a challenge if you're not taking into account all of the factors that can um, influence someone's uh, performance. And so we have tried to get around this challenge by focusing our research on uh, longitudinal designs where we really squarely focus in on prevention because we think that prevention is an important action area. You know, so given that we have this disparity, you know, there, you know, there are no therapies to really change the course of the disease, prevention really does become an important action area. So at Rush, we conduct these large longitudinal epidemiologic cohort studies to identify risk factors for Alzheimer's and cognitive decline, and to try to determine the biologic pathways linking the risk factors to disease so that we can identify um, or develop strategies to prevent Alzheimer's disease. And, um, you know, either by modifying lifestyle behaviors or identifying druggable targets and developing effective therapeutics. So how do we do this, um, especially in an older African-Americans? Well, we need large studies that include people without dementia who are recruited from the community, not just those who are recruited from a memory clinic, since we know that most older African-Americans, especially older African-Americans, you know, never present to medical care um, with, you know, with these symptoms of, um, of Alzheimer's. We also need people who will agree to annual detailed assessment of risk factors, blood donation for genetic testing, and donation of their brain at the time of death because Alzheimer's disease is a disease of the brain and there are particular pathologies that accumulate in the brain. And almost everything that we know about this disease, about the underlying biology, has really only been studied in one population and that's older white adults. So with that in mind, I started um, a study called the Minority Aging Research Study known as MARS in 2004. 
And this study um, consists of more than 800 African Americans who are um, 65 years or older. They enroll without dementia um, at the beginning of the study, and they're recruited from churches, senior buildings, and organizations that cater to older African Americans in the Chicagoland area. Um, everyone gets annual in-home cognitive testing, risk factor assessment, and everyone donates. Well, most people donate um, a small amount of blood. Our follow-up rate is very good. It's greater than 90% among survivors, and we're currently in years uh, 16 to 20. Um, over time, about 10% have developed Alzheimer's dementia. And in um, 2011, we started to recruit for brain um, autopsy because as I told you, most of the information on this disease has come from older whites. And um, you know, because it's so hard to um, recruit for brain donation in diverse uh, populations, we actually um, have a number of different cohort studies at Rush where we are able to pool the data so that we can get uh, you know, a good number of brains from um, our minoritized groups. And so we have over 120 brains, uh, brain donations from African Americans. If we look across all of our different studies, um, it's not possible to get that number, not right now, just from one study alone. So, you know, in, in all of our studies at the Alzheimer's Center, um, including Mars, we followed the traditional longitudinal cohort design with uh, autopsy built in. So we enroll people without dementia at baseline um, and we document a host of risk factors. Um, so let me get my laser pointer. So we, we enroll them with no disease at the beginning and we document risk factors you know, um, at the baseline evaluation. And then we follow people every year, giving them a battery of cognitive function tests. Um, over time, some people will develop Alzheimer's disease, some will develop mild cognitive impairment, and others will remain cognitively unimpaired. Um, but we're able to associate the risk factors that we measure at baseline with change in cognitive performance over time and to incident disease um, at some time in the future. And then those people who die and come to autopsy, we have a range of, um, of, of uh, pathology that we are able to measure in the brain from no pathology all the way to more severe pathology. And we can associate those same risk factors that we measured at baseline with the uh, types and amounts of pathology that, um, that we measure in the brain. We can do all of this in a, within a single study. The approach that we use is a community-centered engagement outreach model where the goal is to foster bi-directional relationships between the community and the research team using a variety of culturally relevant strategies. Um, and we can talk more about that during the Q&A if people are interested. Because we are... Um, trying to keep people in the study for as long as possible um, so that we can understand you know cognitive aging and you know eventually um, hopefully be able to um, receive their brain as a gift after after they die um, we have to do a lot to um, to keep people in the study right to keep them interested and engaged so we spend quite a bit of time and effort building culturally celebratory retention events that serve to keep people invested, engaged, and interested as our partners, you know, not as us uh, as research participants, but really as partners on this journey together to understand cognitive aging in these diverse communities. So um, this slide shows you um, just some basic characteristics of the Mars participants. Um, as I said, there are about 800 self-identified African-Americans in the study currently. Um, it's predominantly women, about 77% women, but that really is uh, very consistent with studies of aging um, where women tend to are more likely to volunteer. Um, the current mean age is about 84 years, and um, they're a relatively educated group. The mean education is 14 years. 
Um, over time, more than 200 have passed away. And we also have a brain imaging um, study um, within Mars. So more than uh, 370 have received an MRI. Some have received multiple MRIs. And um, over half of the cohort that's alive and active have actually agreed to donate their brain at the time of death. Now, Mars is completely African-American, which allows us to understand cognitive aging and risk factors within African-Americans. But we have two other cohort studies of aging um, and Alzheimer's disease at Rush that have been ongoing for 20 plus years. And we're able to combine Mars with these other studies to look at how cognitive aging differs between African-Americans and, and white Americans. So these other two studies um, that have been going on for a long time have over 3,700 older people who enroll without known dementia. Like Mars, they all agree to annual detailed clinical evaluations, you know, uh, you know, risk factor assessment and blood donation. Um, but unlike Mars, these two studies have a, a condition that you have to agree to organ donation at death to be enrolled in a study. This is something that would be very challenging to do in a diverse uh, population, but you know they're able to do it in this study, um, which is you know predominantly white older adults, and and because of this requirement, they now have over seventeen hundred autopsies. Importantly, all three of the studies, Ross Map and Mars, they all use the same cognitive battery, which allows us to merge the data and look across race to understand racial differences when that question is of interest. So, you know, we've been following people for a long time. Um, this is a spaghetti plot that just shows you how much variability exists in the aging uh, profile of our older adults. So just to orient you to the slide, um, what, we, what we've done here is we've plotted um, the aging uh, trajectories uh, by age um, so and, and by race. So we have red lines representing white adults and the black lines represent um, African-American adults. And on, on the vertical axis is the global measure of cognitive function. So we give them, you know, 19 cognitive function tests and we create this global measure uh, of performance. So the positive, you know, higher your score, the better you are performing on the test and the negative scores are, are lower performance. And so what you can see in this graph is, you know, there's a lot of variability both within and across race. There's some people who start high and they maintain their cognitive function over time. There are others that, you know, might start out lower and they 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 decline very quickly, and others somewhere in the middle. But you really see a lot of variability across both groups. But when we take the average of all of these slopes using fancy statistical modeling, we get a pattern shown in these two graphs. So here we're comparing cognitive function over time between African Americans and whites. And just to orient you to this uh, slide, each line represents a five year path of change with people starting at different ages. So we have age on the horizontal axis and cognition on the vertical axis. And higher scores or positive numbers indicate better performance on the cognitive test. The top panel is performance on our semantic, semantic memory tests, which are tests of knowledge, um, like being shown objects and having to name you know, those objects. The bottom panel is performance on our perceptual speed test. White adults are shown by the green lines and African-American adults are shown by the blue lines. And what you can see is that the lines for the white adults are higher. So, so white adults are performing at a higher level on these cognitive function tests, just as I told you previously, but the slopes of the lines are parallel, suggesting that both groups, African Americans and whites, are declining at the same rate over time. You know, the slopes are slanted downward, so everyone is getting a little worse over time, but we're really not seeing any differences between African Americans and whites in the rates of decline over time, except for out if you go out far in the 80s and 90s, you know, 
to the far right, it looks like you know there are some differences there with uh, with the white adults maybe declining a little bit faster. Their their slopes are a little bit steeper, but the data are pretty sparse out there. So um, you know I, we are cautious about interpreting anything out that far. But the point is is that you have these level differences in where people start, but you really don't see any differences in how people change over time. Now, interestingly, you know, we have also replicated this result in a large population-based study that we have at Rush called the Chicago Health and Aging Project, which consists of over 10,000 African Americans and whites who live in uh, four contiguous geographic um, neighborhoods on the south side of Chicago. We enrolled people over the age of 65, and you know, they're followed you know, with a brief set of tests because you know it's 10,000 people, so you can't give 10,000 people, 19 tests, but it's the same concept. You know, I have cognition plotted on the um, vertical axis and age on the horizontal axis, but here I'm showing you people who started the study at age 68, or they started when they were 73, or they started, you know, you know, a little bit older at 78. And what we see is that whites, white adults are performing at a higher level, so at each on each panel, you see the, the line for whites is higher um, than the line for blacks, but you see the lines are parallel for across the board for you follow people for 10 out to 10 years, you see that there's no difference in how people are changing over time. We even see this very same pattern in people who actually have a diagnosis of dementia. So here I'm showing you results from two different studies, and in both cases, Participants had a clinical diagnosis of dementia, but when we measured their cognition and we looked at racial differences and how they were changing over time, we don't see a difference in how people are changing. Even though African Americans started out a little bit lower on these cognitive function tests, they still are not declining any slower than uh, white Americans. So, you know, I've shown you that there seems to be this increased risk of Alzheimer's among African Americans. But when we look at their cognition over time, we, we see that they are performing worse on average on these tests. So you see these level differences, but we're not seeing any evidence that they're declining at faster rates when you follow them over time. We've shown this in our volunteer cohort studies, and I, you know, I just showed you the, the results in the population. We see the same thing. So the question becomes, can we identify risk factors that might explain why older African Americans are scoring lower on these cognitive function tests? Because we know that the cognitive function tests, or we think the cognitive function tests are important, that they're predicting something important, then we should be able to understand why African Americans are performing at a lower level. And so the studies at Rush are really designed to help us identify those factors that might predict not only decline, but also help us understand how they're, why we have these level differences between African Americans and whites. And so, you know, in the field, there has been a number of studies uh, that have published and found that there are established risk factors, you know, for, for Alzheimer's, some that seem to increase your risk, you know, so like age, family history, certain genetic mutations. If you have these, your risk will be increased. So older adults are much, have a higher risk of the disease, for instance. But there are also some that seem to decrease your risk. You know, your years of education, the more education you have, the less, uh, less risk, lower risk you have of the disease. You know, and most of these are non-modifiable. So you, you can't do anything to change them. But there are other risk factors that we and others have published, you know, that tend or seem to be potentially modifiable. Some that appear to um, increase your risk, shown on the left hand side, and others that appear to decrease your risk or they're protective against the disease. These studies, however, have mostly been done in our studies of older white adults. Um, we know relatively little about how these risk factors operate 
in, in African Americans. And really, there is a lack of information on risk factors that reflect the lived experience of older African Americans. And that has been my um, interest in this area to see if that if, if I can measure and, and better understand what role some of these uh, types of risk factors might play in Alzheimer's and cognitive aging. And so in my remaining time, I want to spend um, time just going through a few of these to give you a sense of what we're finding in this space. And I'm just gonna focus on the ones in red um, in the interest of time. So um, in our study, we, we examined some historical factors that we believe shape older African-Americans' lives. So from 1916 to about 1970, there was uh, something called the Great Migration, in which you know about 6 million Black Southerners relocated to urban areas in the North and the West to flee the toxic uh, Jim Crow South. Well, we leveraged this historic life experience by um, examining the effect of geographic place of birth on late life cognition. So all of our participants live in Chicago now, but we asked them where were they born and where were they living at age 12? And we found that about 40% of our participants came from the South. And consistent with previous studies that have shown adverse health effects for Southerners you know, born in the South, we found that participants who were born in the South or living in the South at age 12, shown with the, um, the red bars, um, they had overall lower performance on our cognitive function tests in late life. So we're, we're having people in our study now, their 60s, 70s, and 80s, and we're asking about their early life um, uh, experience, you know, where they were born. But, you know, interestingly, this exposure, geographic place of birth, only affected starting level on these cognitive function tests. It was not related to how people changed over time. So you see, we had people born in the South or living in the South at age 12. They are performing at a lower level than those born in the North or living in the North at age 12. But there are lots of things that are different between the North and the South, especially during that time when people would have been coming up, you know, in the 20s, 30s, the 40s. One thing that we know was different was the um, educational experience of, of African Americans in this age group. Um, we know that this cohort of African Americans who are now in their 70s, 80s, and 90s, they represent the first generation of African Americans to attend legally desegregated schools after the historic Brown versus Board of Education decision in 1954, which ruled that separating children in public schools on the basis of race was unconstitutional. And it really signaled the end of legalized racial segregation. Well, we asked our participants about their experiences attending segregated schools. Um, and we found an interesting interaction uh, of place of birth and school segregation, such that those born in the South who attended legally desegregated schools had the lowest performance on our cognitive measures compared to all the other groups. And I've outlined uh, those uh, participants, uh, their performance in red, in the red box here. So these are people who were born in the South and said that they attended legally desegregated schools. And this, they were their performance was even lower than their counterparts right to the right of them who were born in the South, but attended legally segregated schools. And this was an unexpected finding given that the segregated schools during that time often lacked essential resources and were thought to be inferior to the all white schools. But it's plausible that the experience of integrating schools in early life during a tumultuous racial climate in the deep South where you, know, you clearly were not wanted could have served as an early life stressor for these young African-American children and 40 to 50 years later, when they're in our study and we're measuring their cognition, we can see the impact of the stress on their cognitive function. 
And this would certainly be consistent with the abundant research in, in white adults that shows a negative impact of early life stress on late life health and cognition. Another important contextual uh, social determinant that we have been interested in is discrimination. Discrimination is an important psychosocial stressor for African Americans and has been associated with a number of physical and mental health outcomes, but mostly in young and middle-aged adults. We were particularly interested in this risk factor given its unique relevance for African Americans who came of age before the civil rights movement in the US. This concept of everyday discrimination was introduced originally by um, Philomena Essett in 1991, and it was based on research with Black women in the US and the Netherlands, where um, she inquired about their experiences with more subtle, newer forms of discrimination. And you know, there was a range of events, many of which appeared to be trivial or even normal. You know, there were certain rights, respect, and recognition, which whites took for granted in their own lives were often denied to people of color. These were some of the things that came out of these qualitative interviews that she did with these, um, these Black women. And so um, David Williams, then a, a researcher in the US from Harvard, he then uh, constructed uh, a scale that could be used to measure this, this construct of unfair treatment, disrespect, and sort of microaggressions. Um, and this has been shown, this, uh, this construct has been shown to be associated um, with all kinds of, of uh, poor health outcomes. Um, and some studies, not all, but some studies even show that it partially explains disparities in health. Well, we were one of the first groups to associate this construct with cognition in older African Americans. Um, and using this scale, just, you know, it asks about your, um, the frequency with which you experience unfair treatment in, you know, different settings. Uh, we found that um, older African Americans who reported more experiences of discrimination performed more poorly on our cognitive function tests, particularly tests of episodic memory and perceptual speed. In a separate study, we found that people who reported more discrimination also had higher levels of C-reactive protein in their blood in a very nice dose response fashion, such that those who reported more discrimination had more of the C-reactive protein, which is a marker of inflammation that we can measure in the blood. And it suggests that maybe inflammation is a potential biologic mechanism linking discrimination to poor cognition. Now, I told you that we also do brain scans on our participants, and in a recent um, functional imaging study, we found that um, people who reported higher levels of discrimination also had um, sort of this, this differential uh, functional connectivity in certain areas of their brain. Specifically, discrimination was associated with differential connectivity of areas that are important for trust perception suggesting a potential neurobiologic underpinning of discrimination. But of course, we don't have to just look at history, you know, 30, 40 years ago for, you know, these kinds of experiences. We know that, you know, even today, um, these types of, of microaggressions, you know, some more subtle than others, I mean, some more blatant than others, that these are happening all the time for our diverse um, populations, you know, and so in this current climate, it's clear that we need to be able to operationalize these types of contextual experiences because it might help us design and prioritize interventions and policies, including educational, housing, occupational, and others to reduce the inequities, to mitigate stress, and hopefully to promote healthy aging for all segments of the population. And in fact, we have data from another study that is consistent with this idea that the explanatory mechanism for these contextual experiences, it could actually be stress. In this study, we looked at the relationship of perceived stress 
using a scale that measures the, the degree to which a person finds their lives unpredictable, uncontrollable, and overloading. And we found that African Americans who reported higher perceived stress, <coughs> excuse me, had faster rates of cognitive decline, particularly for episodic memory and visual spatial ability. And you know, this is an important you know, construct for us to understand. Sorry. We also can measure how people are coping with these stressors. There's another construct called John Henryism, which was um, developed by uh, an epidemiologist named Sherman James. Um, and John Henryism is a strategy for coping with prolonged exposures to stressors like discrimination. And it's been linked with higher cardiovascular disease, primarily in Black men. In our Mars cohort, we see that higher reports of John Henryism is associated with lower cognition and effect that is similar in impact to having fewer years of education. <coughs> so why should we care about any of this? Well, most research, as I've told you many times, has been done almost exclusively with one population, and that's older white adults. The consequences of exclusion of one population or multiple diverse populations being excluded are really far reaching. This slide shows recent data from um, the Alzheimer's Association, and it really underscores the importance of trying to understand diversity, trying to understand and, and include diverse participants in our research. What they found in these focus groups was that a major barrier for us as researchers is earning the trust of people of color. If you look at the, the graphic on the left, 62% of, of Black adults believe that medical research is biased against people of color. And only about half believe, if you look at the other on the right-hand side, only about half believe that an Alzheimer's cure will be shared equally, regardless of race, color, or ethnicity. So it makes sense when you look at these types of data, why we struggle so much to have people in our studies. But as researchers, it's up to us to change these perceptions. And it's going to require that we really uh, become partners with our diverse communities, that we start asking questions that are relevant to these communities, and that we really try to understand their narrative and their lived experience so that we can stop making assumptions about this disease based on data from a single population. So in summary, I started this presentation telling you about the persistent racial disparity that we see in Alzheimer's dementia with African-Americans being at a, a higher risk of, of this disease. Um, but you know, I think the data that I've shown you, um, at least the data from, from our studies, it shows pretty clearly that the differences we see in Alzheimer's disease are probably due to racial differences in how people are performing on the cognitive function test those tests that are used to make the diagnosis. A growing body of longitudinal studies, not just from our work, but you know, across other uh, studies are showing that we really don't see any differences in how people change over time. You know, we see these level differences, but we're not seeing differences in change over time. And I didn't have time to talk about the neuropathology that we're collecting, looking at the differences in, in the brain uh, pathology across race we're really not seeing any racial differences there either, you know, suggesting that there's really something else going on with this increased risk, you know, something about the level difference. And so we think that, you know, these race relevant risk factors are really going to be the key to helping us understand um, why older African-Americans are performing at lower levels on these cognitive function tests. And it really could set the stage for future intervention and policy work 
to help us eliminate some of these disparities. And I think finally, um, it's going to be important to design studies that can incorporate the life course and the lived experience um, of our diverse populations, because that is how we're going to advance the science of disparities and really move us towards health equity so that we're really understanding cognitive aging for everyone, not just for a single population. So I'd like to just acknowledge the funders for the work that I talked about today, um, the study participants um, who none of this could be done without them. So we owe a deep debt of gratitude for all the time that they invest um, with us every single year. And of course, the staff of the Rush Alzheimer's Disease Center who are out in the field collecting all this wonderful data for us and uh, the faculty and strategic partners because this really is a team effort. Um, here is our research uh, resource sharing hub if people are interested in, in getting some data to do their own studies and um, my email and Twitter handle. Thank you so much. Looking forward to the discussion. Hi, Lisa. I just want to thank you for uh, an extraordinary uh, talk. Uh, I'm sure uh, Sophia is about to do the same thing as well, but uh, you really just covered so much territory and such Im important topics, um, and uh, it's really much appreciated. Thank uh, you, Andy. I, appreciate I guess it. you know while, while I'm uh, going here, yeah, you know, I, I would. Uh, so you really touched on a number of different risk factors and areas that uh, you know the groundbreaking research from your study and the affiliated studies uh, have been doing. What do you consider the top priorities for you know following up on on those leads or pursuing other related areas in terms of understanding um, these these differences in risk factors? Yeah, great question. Um, I think it's going to be important to start trying to understand some of the factors that might be protective because we really have you know, a fair bit of information about what is impacting uh, cognition in older African-Americans and you know, it's mainly around stressful experiences from early life, right? But um, we want people to be able to maintain their cognition ultimately. So what can we learn about things that they can be doing now? that would protect them from losing their cognition. And so our focus is going to be turning towards those kinds of things, because we know some of that from studies of older whites, but we don't have as much information in older African-Americans. So that's a top priority for us. That, that's great. And, and uh, Andy, I'd like to also, you know, once again, thank you for being here. And, and Lisa, just uh, tremendous work, you know, um, really groundbreaking information to really understand how to affect in a public health way, given this impact of Alzheimer's disease, particularly for minority older adults, getting a little bit more into the preventative. You know, we know that diet plays an important role, right? We're starting to look at the brain gut axis. You know, how do you think nutrition, you know, um, in, in the African-American community, how do you think those dynamics could be affecting brain health differently? How are we going to be able to measure that successfully and to develop public health policy in response to that? Yeah, great question. We know that nutrition is very important for brain health. Um, there's been a number of studies showing um, that the, med the Mediterranean diet and the MIND diet, which is a new diet that was uh, developed at Rush, actually, uh, is really uh, important for maintaining your brain health. And um, we just actually have a paper under review showing that people who eat um, either the Mediterranean diet or the MIND diet have uh, less Alzheimer's pathology in their brain. Um, but the issue is that most of these studies, again, have been done in older white adults. And we know that there are dietary differences across populations. So in Mars, we are just starting to measure uh, uh, diet by using something called the food frequency questionnaire, where we just see what people are eating, the types of food, the amounts and things like that. And we, we're hoping that we'll be able to learn a little bit about how dietary preferences and practices in African-Americans affects cognition over time. And then hopefully we can build an intervention around that, but that's you know further down the line. 
All right, that's really helpful. We have another really thoughtful question in the chat. Um, just wanting to probe a little more deeper about what you talked about, lower levels of trust in relation to the insular areas of the brain. I'm only familiar with the insular cortex being associated with feelings of disgust. So could you elaborate a little bit more on what you just mentioned? Yeah, so there haven't been very many studies looking at this, but I think in, um, in younger populations, there've been some imaging studies and they, uh, this, this area of the brain has been shown to be important for, you know, trusting relationships. Um, you know, they show people different pictures and, you know, determine, uh, you know, show them faces, which one's, you know, a trusting face versus non-trusting face. So um, we looked at the same area in our older adults. And interestingly, this area and people who reported more discrimination on our scale, they, their that part of the brain showed some connectivity differences in people who reported more discrimination compared to those who, who reported less discrimination. Um, and there were a few other findings in the study, but this one we thought clearly mapped on to discrimination because trust obviously is a big component that you, you know, when people are having discriminatory experiences, it's really a matter of, of losing trust. And so, you know, it's all correlational. And of course, we'll have to do follow-up studies to replicate it, but we were really intrigued by that. Yeah. Um, and, and I think, you know, one other really huge thing, you know, you talked about the great migration being a historical event. And yet right now we're on Zoom because of our own historical event, right? The COVID-19 pandemic disproportionately affecting, you know, obviously not old, not only older people, you know, in minority communities, but actually children, right? We're hitting once again, this theme of, of education. And I tell everyone, you know, there's actually three dementia waves are going to come out of this pandemic. The first one is unfortunately, those uh, minority races, and we know that African American and Blacks are much more likely to get critically ill, and if they survive, well, develop some sort of cognitive impairment based on the data we have. Um, we worry that there's something about COVID infection that may predispose to some kind of dementia, even if it's in the mild and moderate range. But um, nobody, um, I think, has yet looked at, but I think probably helpful to do some longitudinal studies, right? Looking at such a severe acute trauma in the educational system, which, you know, the latest data was released. You know, we've seen a drop of about five years of achievement, but it was disproportionately hit in the minority communities that weren't able to switch to virtual learning, right? Due to technological access, due to technological, you know, literacy differences, right? What do you think, you know, now, what do, what do you think, you know, pre if prevention is everything, what do you think now using your data from the Great Migration, how would you recommend as we think about early learning, prevention of late life, cognitive decline, dementia? What, what, what are your thoughts there thinking ahead? Or yeah. just a big research question that we need to study first before we- We, can we definitely need answer. to study more in that area. I don't know of any studies that have looked at, you know, people younger ages- who might have experienced COVID and you know followed them over time? That's a great um, idea, um, but I think my research suggests that you know there's stress is I think is the big component here that I'm measuring right. And COVID act you know obviously was a very stressful time for everyone, but it did impact as you said um, diverse populations more. Um, and also, you know, because these diverse populations were much more likely to have the health conditions, the multiple, you know, chronic conditions that we know really uh, interacted with COVID, right? And so I think the message should be that we need to do things to help mitigate stressors. We need to uh, provide many more uh, access, much more access to resources for these diverse populations so that people, you know, you know, even though we all had to go online during those, you know, that two year shutdown, or maybe it was only a few months shut down, felt like two years, but, you know, there were clear differences in access to technology, you know, access to resources, um, you know, access to band, you know, high bandwidth. Um, so those things we have to be able to change so that when we have a, a, an epidemic, a crisis, a public health crisis like that, that we're all able to um, rise to the occasion at the same level. There should not be these disparities in how people cope with it, with something like this because of basic inequities in our in our structures of society. So I think my research is helping us to understand some of these inequities that exist that existed a long time ago, but that are still present today. 
And when we face something like COVID, it just really shows how, um, how the disparities you know, show up for these, these diverse communities. Well, Lisa, uh, if there's any junior researchers out there who are seeking to build a career, I, I think the ADRCs are also a huge uh, support structure to get people started. You heard it from Lisa. This is a pressing public health question that if you want to study and begin to understand uh, how education affects uh, late life cognition and Alzheimer's disease, uh, I think Lisa has said that's a that's certainly a big area of funding. So, yes. um, well, there was so much still yet to unpack. We hope to have you back um, as we continue to have other uh, discussions and symposiums, um, but we will need to wrap it up for now. If you didn't have a chance to ask a question um, or you have other questions after watching this, you can certainly email us and we're going to show that slide. And Lisa will always uh, is very diligent and thoughtful and will get back to us with her answers. Yes. Thank you so much. And, and we hope to have you back again soon. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And congratulations you again, on your Lisa. honor. Uh, thank you so much. Take care. Have Thanks, a, Andy. Have a bye good bye. Thanksgiving, everybody. You too. Take care, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you so much for joining us today to hear from our guest speaker, Dr. Lisa Barnes. Any unanswered questions can be emailed to IADC evt at iu.edu and we'll get back to you with those answers you should be receiving a post-assessment evaluation in your email inbox we really encourage you to take a few minutes to respond in order to assist us in future planning we'd also like to encourage you to stay in touch with our center and to learn more about our latest ongoing educational events and activities you can follow us on facebook or twitter you can also check out our email site at medicine.iu.edu slash IADRC. Thank you so much, and we look forward to meeting you next year again.